Complete History of the World by Stephen Hartley. Four billion ish years ago, the first little one cell life forms were created, and our newborn souls had something to inhabit, to have a lifespan. Now we skip forward a couple of billion years and now we've got life forms capable of having other life forms within them, the, the bacteria, so this symbiotic relationship, that was a big step. But because our souls started so, 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 so small, it took time for them to grow. Where did we go when we weren't in a life? Well, we have a possession. You have a possession, that's you. You have a place in the universe. It's at the centre of every galaxy is a black hole. And that black hole is a portal to a lower universe, a newer universe. And at one point it was brand new, and that's when you got created. And God has several planets in the universe, several living planets, which are for us to have experiences on. So every seventh life, you come to Earth. And you've been every single little animal on this planet. In the beginning, they were very basic. And up until 300-ish million years ago, it was always underwater. We hadn't even broken the surface of the water. So we spent the last 300 million years, every seventh life, being an animal on this planet. Now, your other six lives in between are on different planets and they're probably completely different and I, I, I've I only had a smidgen of uh, insight into what that might be like. So I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the history of the earth. So God has been guiding us all through this, all through this, every time getting a slightly more complex animal. And for different personalities, because every soul is unique, every soul has got its part to play. And we're all in this, if you like, crash course together. So whatever we're doing is, you know, helping others and we're being helped by others. And, but, you know, you've got your individual path and God knows it. God knows you better than you know yourself, knows exactly what you need to learn in your next life, etc. So we get to about 200,000 years ago or up to a million years ago when perhaps we were now becoming complex enough that we had hands uh, and and you know we could walk on two feet and and we could perhaps start to use tools or just a stick to knock a piece of fruit out of the tree or something or to throw it even and then we get to about 40,000 years ago when we've got the first Homo sapien. And that was Adam. And Adam was different than any being that any of our souls had inhabited before. Adam had free will. Because before in our the lives we had before this, we were very much carrying out the operations of the gene with our personality. But it was just basically execute the genetic design, right? So you're a lion, you hunt. You're a impala, you run away. <laughs> so 
So the first being that had the capability to sit there and think, consider, and able actually to do something that was wrong. So before, so being a dinosaur and you're a Tyrannosaurus Rex and you go and bite the head off of something um, because you're hungry, right? There was no error in that, you know. You were just executing what the being is that you were. But we develop enough to inhabit a being that had more abilities. Now, at that time, 40,000 years ago, the soul that inhabited Adam was the soul who was currently at that time higher than any other soul, at least the ones coming to Earth. They were higher because they'd, they'd been doing better. They'd been a better hunter as a lion, a better finder of food as an ape, you know, or even, say, leader of a pack. They were doing that well. It was, you know, their soul had learnt lessons, and each time coming back as a life, it was, it was doing well. So, at that point, the soul that inhabited Adam, he was like God's cream of the crop. But that's always been changing. The line, the first will be last, and the last will be first. It's always changing in our development. So go back two billion years, and it was flipped up on its head. You know, the one that was Adam at that time was like the, the worst. So when Adam was on Earth, there would have been lots of souls who were still living lives as animals. But as time has progressed, we've got to the stage where all our souls, children of God, are living lives of humans. So the life force in the lower, less complicated, more animals is no longer us. And this would have been the same, you know, we would have stopped being those one-celled organisms. So the life force that carried on in the, those, those one-celled organisms, because they're still needed to keep everything balanced, is God. So God's life force at the moment is in all the animals. But when Adam came and he was the first, there were still apes and things like that that still had souls in. So other life forces, children of God life forces. So Adam was made, I think about 40,000 years ago. And what we've got in the Bible, because I'm using the word Adam, so what we've got in the Bible for those first generations up until Noah is a very much elongated story of what went on. And there'll be truths in there, but they won't necessarily have happened exactly how they happened and all that stuff about, oh, so-and-so lived for 963 days, years. You know, that, that could all well just be, you know, the, what people made up at the time. It was a telling a story. So anyway, Adam has the ability to, to make errors. He can make an error which he will feel the result of in his soul. So that is a new thing. We had not had that before. Everything was just, you know, just great. You couldn't, basically, you couldn't make a mistake. You didn't have, you didn't have that freedom. You could make a mistake in the sense of you hadn't quite got this right yet, you know, or you failed at that. But that didn't, like, that didn't come back on your soul like a, a negative thing. So the first being that's capable of doing that is bound to do it. And his first mistake was to not listen to Eve, reject Eve's point of view. So, and there was a, you know, and there were, and the result of that was something negative, and has continued in subjugating women since then. Everybody knows and no one's saying nothing. Everybody knows. No one's saying nothing. It would sound so very loud that no one can hear. <clears throat> That's it. That's what happens, you know. This is. Um my big theory um, 
and one of the first things that came to me after my born again moment. And eye colour had always been a thing in my mind. My mum had blue eyes, my dad had greeny brown eyes. And it was always something that perplexed me, I suppose. I was curious about it. And what I always felt was that looking into the eyes of a brown eyed person, you could kind of reach into their soul. But looking into the eyes of a blue eyed person, there seemed to be this shield, this sort of disconnect. You didn't feel like you could truly reach in and know what they're thinking. See their mind ticking in a sense. Whereas brown eyed, it does look like you can. Now, it's so entwined with everything. It's just, it's one of these theories that I, I had and I've, I say I've gradually been putting it aside because it's sort of, it's so difficult to, to prove, to get decent um, concrete evidence for, which there should be. And the evidence is there, but it's sort of obfuscated. For example, I wanted to look at historic battles to see the casualties on each side. You could get the casualty numbers, but only the total casualty numbers. There was nowhere I could find where I could find... You can, for World War II, find out how many people from each country have died. But historical battles, that's important. I wanted to know you know, how many of them on that side died compared to how many of these on this side. But that was just unavailable. So, but, we kind of don't need it because, let's face it, we can, we understand that when the Vikings were raiding France and Britain, um, you know, they were quite small numbers against larger numbers and they were having a lot of success and um, right so for some of you who don't know what I'm on about here we go the, the color of the eyes of your vehicle in this life right the color of your eyes has a massive effect on your relationship with the planet and other people. And it's, it's, um, can be backed up with some scripture. When Cain killed Abel, God sought him out. And God said, because of this, I'm going to, give you a mark and uh, you know your your crops aren't going to grow you know you're not going to be able to get your wealth from the land and Cain protested and as a sort of a okay so that's a punishment so okay it's Cain protested well oh, the, the beasts will kill me and stuff so he said okay I'll give you a mark and everyone will know anyone who attacks you is going to get it seven times back. So it's um, changing the karma law. You know, the, the karma, the general karma should be equal, shouldn't it, right? You do that to me and, and you'll get the same back, right? So the karma law changed. It was now do something to Cain and you'll get seven times back the whatever you do to Cain and but for Cain he can't 
you know, he's he's going to try and grow some strawberries, and they're just going to, you know, they're not going to be a good crop. Maybe get one or two, but not very good. So his relationship, his relationship with the ground has changed, and his relationship with everybody else has changed. So my first theory was, well, this mark of Cain is green eyes. And it's quite a popular video on my older YouTube about this. Very soon after I'd worked it out. So I've had quite a few years of letting it sink in and, um, and seeing. Now the experts, if you look on Wikipedia, will tell you that people with blue eyes, it's just uh, they haven't got any pigment. And people with grey eyes have got a little bit of pigment. People with green eyes have got a little bit more pigment. People with brown eyes have got more pigment. Just a question of pigment. Um, but th this doesn't really add up for me because I can see um, more things going on with the eyes. Uh, obviously the size of your pupil is going to affect the intensity of the colour. But with people's, someone's, you know, someone with blue eyes can have small pupils and their eyes can be really an intense blue. And someone can have a really, really washy light blue. And people can have quite dark blue eyes as well. So, you know, there, there's quite a lot of variance there that doesn't suggest to me they all got no pigment. And with my eyes, particularly, my eyes change a lot. You know, I've I've had, I was born with blue eyes. After about a year, they went brown, and then they've gradually been getting sort of green. Well, they sort of stayed there, but they can change. I went there was a stage in Norway, and my, I looked in the mirror, and my eyes were just brown. There were no green in there; it was just nice brown. I like that. But I felt really different. It was it was quite scary actually. So I know there's something going on. Also, there's the the. Around the colour part of your eyes, you have a line. Now, sometimes that line is a nice thick black line, and sometimes it's very thin and washy. And what I've noticed in my own life, when I really wasn't sure in myself about, you know, what, where I am and what's going on, you know, I'm really sort of unsure. Then that line around my eyes is is very weak. But when I'm certain about, you know, my viewpoint and everything else, then I've noticed that line around the outside of the colour bit is strong, sometimes quite thick. So yeah, and the, the darkness and the lightness of the eyes, I, I'd say is your, you know, you, you, when your eyes are dark in a sense inside you're feeling murderous. <laughs> and when they're light, you are, you're happy, you're fine, you know, you're not likely to snap at anyone. And this has helped with dogs actually, looking at dogs' eyes, if they're dark, I would be wary of them. And if they're bright, then I probably wouldn't have a problem with them. Anyway, I digress. So, Kane kills bro, he ends up getting green eyes. Which is the rarest colour today, by the way. Like, one or two percent of people have green eyes. Very rare. Now, now a little bit later on, a few pages on in the Bible, not long to go, but a couple, few generations have passed, and there's uh, Lamech on Cain's side. He takes two wives. It's like another sin, you know. Cain killed his brother, that was a sin. Now Lamech's taking two wives, taking somebody else's soulmate. And it just, all it says in the Bible, it says, and if Cain be avenged sevenfold, I'll be avenged seventy-seven. And f um, I could kill a man for being striked or something like that. <clears throat> Someone could slap him and his, car his karma coming back is so strong they could die for that. So it's like 49 times the strength of the karma. Now if he got the karma, he must have also got the other thing, which is the the change in the relationship with the land. Now if Cain's crops don't grow very well, it's you know, slightly rubbish, what's going to happen to Lamech's? And my personal feeling is this, this is where we have introduced the, um, the blights and things like that which affect, can affect crops or insects, you know, can come and sort of just ruin the crop, right? And he would have been marked as well. So the mark would then be, for him, blue eyes. 
So all of Cain's descendants are getting green eyes. It's staying in the descendants. It's not going away. And I think it's this, some, some aspect of this is, that is true. Back several thousand years ago, however long ago this happened, it could be 20,000 years ago. Um, but here we are today, different color eyes and things going on. <laughs> You'll know this. It's just so loud you can't hear it. <laughs> um, so this would have caused quite a ruckus back at the time. And although we have in the scriptures and everything about the fallen angels and stuff like that, I think that is this is the time where there was this problem. And most of the people are going to be brown eyed righteous, their crops grow fine. Now, maybe they can tolerate the odd green-eyed person. You know, they can stay away from the crops. Um, you know, if we're nice to them, we've got lots of love back. It's quite nice. They're quite entertaining, you know. <laughs> right? Something like that. But these blue-eyeds, you know, take in somebody else's wife and you know, can't do anything to them because even if you just slap them, they're going to die for it. So I think they were expelled. You expelled, taken to another part of the world. And back in those days, if they saw their world as sort of like Middle East and stuff like that, it was just, you know, you get out of our world. And they perhaps could do it while there weren't that many of them. Um, so where am I going with this? This, this is the story of where we are. So let's bring it to today, modern day. We've got a shed load of blue-eyed people out there, shed load of brown-eyed people, and a few green-eyed people. Now the blue-eyed people, they, they don't like the nature, because the nature doesn't like them. You know, and they know this. They, they hate insects. They go outside and the insects buzzing around them. <laughs> right? And they hate it. So why would they want insects to thrive and stuff like that? Well, they don't. So they will continue doing idiotic things like just, you know, mowing all the green spaces, you know, I mean, how good is that for the insects? They depend on long grass to lay their eggs and everything else, and some mower comes along and mows it all down, and that's going to all get rotted and everything, it's, they're probably not going to survive. And it's a real problem. And there's not going to be any scientific, you know, reinvention of the tree. It's there. Nature is there. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, it's God's plan. God knows, I'm sure. But I think it's possible to, to change. To change the colour of your eyes. I've seen me being a greeny-eyed person. Although, often on camera, they look different colour. They look blue or something. But, um... I, I have had quite a few occasions looking at a blue-eyed person and they're standing in front of them, their eyes go green. So it's, um, it's, I think that's the way it's possible. And I know that my eyes became brown I went, it's when I went to live in Norway. And you know, like I say, I felt weak. And I know it's also when people, when I've seen their eyes go green, I no notice how they, there's something in them. They don't like it. And it's like you become weaker. You've got all that karma, that extra power, you you enjoy that, it makes you powerful. And they know it. They might not know why, but they do know it. Um, so, but it's it's going to be a necessary thing um, for the planet. So it must be part of God's plan. So why did my eyes change to brown when I went to Norway? Well, I was living a very righteously I was, um, I stopped smoking cannabis. I was just, you know, my, I was doing things, going on long walks and skiing and working, you know, it's all sort of outdoory, good, wholesome fun. Eating really healthily. I'm not sure I eat chocolate. Anyway, and I, it was a time I was washing my own clothes and stuff and just, you know, apart from all the masturbating, <laughs> being in a, in a house of my own for the first time in my life, right? I did, did do that 
wasn't particularly righteous. But I was washing my own clothes and I walked up to the mirror and I looked in the mirror and I completely, and my eyes completely brown and clear and it was all like, yeah. But I f felt this weakness, I felt this vulnerability. So I kind of wasn't comfortable with it. So it's possible to do. And I think it has to be the goal. And um, no idea how God's going to do it. But, yeah. It needs to be done because, you know, say we had a massive war and most of the brown eyed people got wiped out. Um, it wouldn't bode well for for the future. We, we can't continue being dependent on pesticides and fertilizer. So that's, if you like, one of the modern ways to get around this problem. If you're a green-eyed person, you like gardening, you're going to need to add fertilizer, say. And um, if you're blue-eyed, you'll also have to be spraying and using pesticides. It's, and it's exactly what we see in the world. And I think, I say everybody knows this, maybe not intellectually, but I do think the powers that be know this intellectually. So they absolutely understand why they need to be using pesticides and fertilizers, and I think this is also why they are quite keen to bring people into their country who've got brown eyes. Because it's like... I guess part of the rule is it's not just perhaps who's growing the food but who owns the land and who's going to be eating the food that that has an effect on it. It's, like I say, the one difficult thing about this, it's a very simple concept but it's just because of the numbers of people and the size of the earth and it just gets really sort of huge.